Tom, thanks so much for joining me on my radio show. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. So what I wanted to, well, first of all, let me talk for a second. Um, I, I heard of your name, but I didn't know about your ATG read, read system until one of my newsletter subscribers told me about it. And he was saying, oh, there's this great, great thing that helps you to balance your reads. I'm like, oh, okay, I never heard of it. And then another person, another newsletter subscriber said the same exact thing. And he gave me a whole history and he told me how great it was and how he, you know, all of his reads work because of your system. And I'm like, all right, I have to, I have to check this out. And I did. And I love it. I love the ATG read system. So what I wanted to ask you was, you know, what was your inspiration for creating this, this ATG read system? Uh, well, um, it's kind of a long process because, uh, the ATG read system I looked for, so to speak, or tried to develop or work on for about 20 years. Um, and yeah, uh, I really hadn't had any read problems for, well, I mean, uh, I would often give lectures to clarinet players and, uh, you know, I would tell them that, you know, gee, really haven't had read problems for the last 25 years. And they would look like, look, look at me like I was from the moon or something. Right. (laughs) But it, it was, it was really true. I developed a machine. There was a machine called a Redo All. You may have heard of it. Um, and it never worked for me. And I had it around for a long time. And and this is back in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And I, uh, I took it apart. And I said, well, there's your problem. So I, f- I fixed it the way that I thought it would work better. And sure enough, it worked fantastically well. And I was able to balance my reads really beautifully with that machine for for quite a while and um when i left uh education i was teaching university uh and i got more involved in the technical aspect of things uh it really broke my heart to leave teaching because uh it really meant so much to me to be able to teach students and teach the clarinet and and so uh I kept, even though I was in the technical part of things and I was working uh, at LeBlanc Corporation, um, I, I persisted. I, I wrote, an, uh, actually, I wrote a series of articles in their a magazine called LeBlanc Bell, which is all about, uh, the, the articles were almost all about music education and, and especially clarinet education and teaching students uh, how to play the clarinet. And um, I, I realized that... Um, that the biggest single problem in in uh, students, young people developing uh, and have, being able to consistently develop playing the clarinet, and it was true for me when I started out and for years and years, uh, is that uh, the biggest impediment to making steady progress was the read. Um, un- playing various unbalanced reads really forced you into bad habits to just make things work. You know, you, you didn't buy it. You didn't mess up your embouchure and stuff because you're a bad guy. It was, it was because that you had to do what you had to do to make defective equipment work. And so I thought if students could have, have better reads out of the box, that um, it would dramatically improve their ability, not just to sound better on a given occasion, but to have really good reads all the time. So I began a quest looking for a simplified method of reed finishing because, you know, most people consider reed finishing a kind of a black art, you know. Yes. And, uh, and so uh, very complicated and people go and I've spent a lot of money working with someone trying to learn very complicated procedures on working on reeds. And I tried to boil things down to their simplest form um, and – and I thought it's not just adequate to give someone a tool that might be superior, it might work. The p- tool's got to be portable. It's got to be easy to use. It's got to be very easy to facile, easy to use, so you could work in, in the moment. And um, it, and also, it does no someone no good if you give them, say, wonderful tools, um, if they don't have any tools of analysis. To know how to use them and what to do so I thought about having a read system where uh, that would you would not only supply the means of working on reads and talk about how to work on reads 
but also you would give an education as to actually how to test reads to diagnose what's really wrong. So I, I came, as I developed this this idea, I came up with, with the, the, the kind of catchphrase is the, the better you test, the less you guess. Because so many people, when they worked on reads, they said, well, I kind of work on reads intuitively, you know, uh, which meant to me that they didn't know what they were doing and that they probably ruined more reads working on reads than they actually made reads better. And so um, so with those criteria, plus I, I didn't want it to be expensive. I wanted it to be accessible so young players could use it effectively um, and um, they could signif significantly improve the reads. And I looked for that off and on for the longest and longest time and thought about the methods and means of how to do it. It's kind of a convoluted process in terms of looking at it uh, in, in hindsight, kind of ex post facto reasoning. Uh, but I, uh, when, I, when I hit on the system, I asked myself a question that I don't think anyone had ever asked. And I gave an answer that no one has ever given. And I tried it, and it worked. And it worked so well that it blew my mind. I mean, I mean literally, because I, you know, I was working at, at that time in Texas at Brook Mays and a uh, music store. I was their clarinet specialist. And I was kind of working alone. I did have an assistant. And um, I couldn't believe that the answer to having wonderful reads consistently was as simple it was ridiculously simple. The, what I did to finish the reads and the results I got were incongruous because I, you think it should be very difficult and complicated, but when you have the right tool for the right job and you use it in the right way, it's not really very hard. So I finished these reads and that were hardly playable, and I made them play wonderfully in a short period of time. And finally, I blindfolded myself and, read, and finished the reads. And I, I have a couple of videos online that are where I finish take reads that hardly make a sound. And with about a minute and a half or two minutes uh, blindfolded, I have the read playing on the, mouth, on the mouthpiece. Um, and, yeah, I know it sounds crazy, but, uh, but you, can, you can really do it. Like, it's, no, it's not an issue. Uh, if you test the read right, then the finishing – uh, the, the testing correctly is the hardest thing. Um, <clears throat> the finishing is, is kind of like, you know, kind of an afterthought. Like, but, but if you don't analyze the read right by testing, then you're, you're not going to get the, the best results that you can get. But uh, anyway, when I hit on the method, it was so good that I couldn't make my mind accept the results. And I mean, it's, I'm not exaggerating. And so for a month, like I would finish reads one week and then the next week I would finish a new batch of reads and I would check the reads the, from the previous week. And then the third week I would check the reads and I kept checking back and forth to see that I wasn't completely out of my head. And uh, by the fourth week, I called my assistant in who had her master's degree in performance. She's a very good clarinet player. So I said, Heather, I said, um, uh, I said, let, let me show you something. And I took a read and I tested it. And I, I said, you can hear how that's badly balanced, right? And she said, yes. And I said, uh, hand me that towel over there. And she handed it to me and I put it over my head, which I know was, looked ridiculous. But I took the read and I finished it. And then took the towel off my head and I put it on the on the on the mouthpiece and I played it and it sounded great, right? And she said, "Oh yeah, but you know you're the master of all that stuff, you know." And I said, "Look, I'll make up a set of tools for you. I'll show you the finishing techniques, and you just go home and do, you know, you you work on you you got some reads that don't work at home." And she said, "Oh yes, I've got all kinds of reads that don't work." I said, "Well, go home and work on them, you know." And so um, she and I both had Monday off, and that was on a Saturday. And uh, Monday evening, I got an email, and um, there was only three words on it. She said, 
you're a genius. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And the next day she came in and she said, I finished 25 reads. I've got the best reads I've ever had in my life. If I'd had these on my master's recital, it would have been child's play. <laughs> and she's, you know, so then I knew, uh, and then I do, did one more test. I, um, there are five finishing techniques in the read system. And so, um, I came into Brookmays one day and I pulled out a box of, I think, number four of Van Doren reads which are basically fit my mouthpiece pretty well. And I thought, I just want to see how dumb this can get. Just how easy can it get, right? So I pulled out the reeds and I tested through the whole, the whole box and I had about, about eight of the 10 reeds were really unacceptably badly balanced, which is the biggest problem is bad balance. And I, I did my standard testing, which I describe in the reed system and demonstrate. Um, and so then I mixed the reeds up and I took the, the finishing tools and I, I did the tip, the reed, um, uh, the, the first finishing technique, uh, which is just it, the, the tip of the, the tip of the, the, reed the tip, tip finishing. Right. And I, I did that and I did that to every one of them. Right. Irrespective of, I didn't, I didn't know what they were cause I mixed them all up. Then I put them back in the box, and I knew how badly that they were balanced and what the percentages were. So, so uh, when Heather came in, I had them all back in the box, and I tossed the box to her, and I said, Heather, I said, when you get some time, would you test through, through these reads and, and tell me what you think of them, especially, uh, you know, how they play? And, and she said, sure. So... I went to lunch and um, I came back and Heather was there and she said, I got the reads finished testing. And I said, oh, good, good. Well, let me uh, let me see what she came up with. And she said she had them all separated and organized, which is typical of Heather. She said, well, she said, these three reads, see, these are really these are like concert type reads. I could take play these on any any concert. And she said, and these four reads. And then these reads are, are excellent practice reads. I could play those. And then this reads a little too heavy for me, and these two are a little lighter, something like that. It was broken up, something like that. And I said, okay. I said, so those are a little heavy, and those are a little light, and then these, these are good. Yeah. And so, I, and then I gave, asked her the $64 question. I said, well, what about the balance? She said, oh, they were all balanced. Wow. Right. So then I knew that it, if if a kid got the system and got the tools, that that um, uh, that if they could only perform the tip finishing technique, right, number one, right, right. Number, number one, uh, they and then finally I made a discovery about that which I'd already suspected, but if they could just do the tip finishing technique, that they could dramatically improve the quality and performance. And the and and the degree of balance uh, in any box of reads that they opened up, right? That's a big deal. Yeah. That's really a big deal because I really wanted because I had no read problems, uh, but I wanted to develop this so kids would have better reads to play, make the clarinet more fun to play, make their development more easily you know achieved, and basically play the clarinet the rest of their life you know instead of yeah, at a certain point, cringe and say, I don't know, I can't put up with this stuff anymore. And they put it, the clarinet in their closet. And actually, this would help. Uh, I'm just thinking to myself, this would help band directors, especially ones that buying reads is part of their budget. So what yeah. they could do is open up the box and they could do that read finishing tip number one on a whole box. And if, you know, if they're giving reads to their students, they'll know that they have a huge, huge percentage, better chance that those reads are going to, you know, work. Absolutely. Oh, it's not. It's 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 not. I mean, it's not even in doubt. Uh, they would absolutely have better reads, uh, significantly better reads. And and you can hear it because when when reads are beautifully balanced, they're they they have increased resonance. They have increased depth. Uh, and uh, you know, it's like two the the ears of the read are like two stereo speakers. If you have them out of phase, they cancel out each other. Not on, in sound. Not only do they not have the right sound, a clear sound, but they also cancel each other out in terms of resonance, and so you don't get that full sound. But when you get a clarinet section 
where the kids all have beautiful balanced reeds. The sound is, I mean, the presence of the sound is significant. And we're not talking about just playing louder. We're just talking about the sound being resonant and having more more presence, right? Projection, yeah. Like just, you know, if you're playing more in tune, it's going to project more. If your reeds are more balanced, it's going to project more. You're not fighting it. Right. So uh, not long after that, um, of course, you know, I didn't really, I don't have a, not a big company. I, I didn't have a big budget or anything, but I, I, I got on the slate at the 2005 International Clarinet Festival at Atlanta. And uh, I represented my business. I was selling mouthpieces and, and, and uh, customized clarinets and stuff like that at that time. And um, I, was, I gave my lecture on the reed finishing system. And I went in the first 45 minutes. I essentially described the methodology that I was using, why I was using it, how I had arrived at it, and so on and so forth. And then in the last 20 minutes or so of the lecture, I pulled out several reeds, and I balanced them there in real time. And I had, it was in the afternoon, I had a pretty big crowd, is probably about 200 clarinet players there. Um, and uh, so I balanced those reeds, showed them how easy it was. Uh, and then I actually asked someone to come up from the audience, and I told them what techniques to use. They used it, and the reed played great. So... And they had no idea what they were doing. They were just like mechanically following my instructions after I tested the read. And so I got back into the, you know, the display area where all the products were being displayed. And there was literally a line out the door uh, waiting to buy the system. I sold out 75 systems and then I had to take back orders. That's awesome. And then from there, then the reed system exploded. And just to give you an idea of how good it was, I called Scott Kurzweil, who used to be the uh, woodwind buyer for Brasswind Woodwind. And he and I got to be very good friends, which we still remain good friends. And uh, so I was calling him on some unrelated subject. And I said, uh, this is a couple years later. So I said, Scott, um, you know, uh, you guys sell all the reed, all the reed finishing tools. You know, machines and everything, right? Because pros always get their, we're, we're getting their stuff from a few sources. The brass one, woodwind being one of the main ones. So, I said, uh, you got the data there on your computer. I said, how, how does how does my reed system sell in reference to the others? And he said, okay, yeah, I'll look it up. So, he looked it up and he said, wow. I said, what is it? He said, your read system sells like four times more. And I said, like, I don't know, what do you mean, like four times more than the next product below it? He said, no, we sell four times more of your read finishing system than we do all the rest combined. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. <laughs> and it's all been done just by word of mouth, you know. People get something that works just like you with your your, your students, Right. And they said, you just got to try this. It's, that's the way it happens. So the sales and uh, finally I got a I got a letter from uh, Reinhard Fieser, who plays in the Vienna Philharmonic. And he wrote me and he said, I ran into your reed finishing system in Indiana when I was with Her Howard Klug. And he said, and I use your educator's guide to the clarinet. And he said, uh, I study, you, we study that with my students. And he said, it's fantastic to improve their playing a great deal. And he said, your reed finishing system has cut my reed finishing down uh, to almost 70 by 75%. And I have really wow. great reads all the time. He said, I'm just writing you to thank you. And I just want you to know if you ever come to Vienna, you have a friend. That's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm thinking too, as you're talking, you know, um, I remember um, when I was taking music ed courses in order to become a music teacher, you know, yeah. no one ever talks about finishing reeds, you know, because it, it, like you said, it's like the dark art, you know, it's a scary yeah. type of thing and uh, no one ever talks about it. So like when kids would come up to me, uh, this is at the time I was playing saxophone, but I also grew up playing trumpet, brass instruments. Um, but kids would come up and their reeds would be unbalanced. But, you know, as a music educator, you also 
aren't necessarily allowed to maybe have reed knives and all those types of things in school, especially right. nowadays. And I'm just thinking in my head right now, you know, if I would have had, if I would have known about your system at the time, um, it would have been fine. It would be something that's safe to have in a school as a teacher. Absolutely safe. Yeah. Because there's no knives involved. It's just basically, you know, your your specialized tool with the sandpaper and and the glass, uh, you know, um, surface to finish the yeah. reed. So, I mean, I think that's a great thing. And I'm also thinking about how a lot of us travel on a plane and yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I had this machine that, that I used, like I said, and I had it set up in a special way, and it balanced reeds very well. But after using the, the reed finishing uh, uh, system, my own system, to, after probably about eight or nine months, I said, I think I'm going to sell this machine because yeah. Yeah, because I finished reeds better with more refinement, more easily be with the system than I did with the stupid machine, right? <laughs> and, so, and so I so I sold it, and uh, I've I've never used one since. And I've I've never, you know, having balanced reads. One of the beautiful things about having balanced reads. Um, cause, by the way, I want to talk about professionals in contrast to students. But having balanced reads is really a wonderful thing because the reads play much more consistently in all kinds of contexts. And when I was at LeBlanc. I would go give lectures on playing the clarinet and teaching the clarinet and uh, various things all over the country. And, I, you know, I'd fly to Florida and then I'd fly to California and then I would, you know, go to different places uh, down to the, to, to, you know, to the coastline and up into the mountains. My reeds played great all the time. And I, I recall um, I was asked to give a lecture on reed finishing at uh in in at kingsville in utah I mean, it's been a while uh, anyway um the guy asked me if i wanted to play and i for, originally i said no and then i thought well i i've designed this c clarinet and it's a fantastic c clarinet so i told him i, I want to play the k1 i can't remember the number of the kirkle number and he said what is that and i said well that's the mozart oboe quartet and, and I'll, I'll play it on the C clarinet. Wow. Yeah, so I, I, I played it. We played it in the recital, and uh, and they did a recording. I have still have the recording, and it's pretty darn – we only rehearsed one time. It's a pretty darn good performance. Awesome. And the C, the C clarinet's just – this C clarinet is, is just fabulous. In fact, Ricardo Morales plays one, and, and – um, um, Carrie Bell plays one in the San Francisco Symphony. It's about six symphony players are playing the, my C clarinet. But I anyway, I, I got there and, it, and it's at 7,000 feet, which is, which is my point. I'm sorry to be so long getting into the point. But there were several other clarinet players who were playing, and they, they had come from Wyoming and you know neighboring areas, and they were grousing and complaining about how bad the reeds were. The reeds play completely different from 3,000 feet to 7,000 feet. And I'd come from Dallas, which ain't that high, right? So, but I'm pulling out my reeds, and I've got about six reeds that I could play, right? Like, and, and they're all like, oh, man, I, my reeds aren't working, you know? My reeds are completely different from Salt Lake City up to here and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, but I just came from Texas, you know? <laughs> and my reeds are playing great. And th the difference is, is that these guys really didn't have well balanced reeds for the most part, and the and the reeds go wacko. You know, the the, the differences in playing from an uh, from area to area, and and you know the differences in playing is really significant um, when the reeds are unbalanced. They, there's something about the imbalance that exaggerates them more when you get in different conditions. Uh, humidity and altitude and so on, but really well balanced reeds play with tremendous consistency, and you can go all kinds of places. So, I was going to ask you about that. I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's talking about altitude, and I'm wondering because I lived in New York all my life, and then for the last two years I moved out to uh, to L.A. and it's so dry out here, and you know squeak a lot more. But I, I'm glad that you mentioned that. So then the well balanced reeds would handle the changes in humidity from like you know very humid to dry yeah it's i mean essentially you're looking at a at, at a at a at a bundle of um a bundle of straws and 
that are that are you know are transferring energy up and down the surface of the reed and when when the reed is not properly balanced it's twisting on the mouthpiece and that essentially that uh, playing unbalanced reeds also just basically destroys the structure of the reed because this, the reed doesn't work like that and then you're trying to force the thing into working with your embouchure and forcing it to vibrate in a way uh, that, that it makes it playable. And what the reed really needs is to be structurally corrected so that it can work structurally properly. So it's not twisting. So the energy is really efficiently flowing up and down. So the reeds last a lot longer. Uh, but I do want to say this about uh, about the, the ATG system. Like very soon after I developed it, uh, Eddie Daniels started using it. And uh, he came to Dallas and he played a concert and and, he, and I went back to congratulate him and, and he said, hey, man, I, I just finished working on this read with the system before I went out to play. But and um, Ricardo Morales uh, uses a system. Uh, John Ye up in Chicago uses a system and and um, John Manassi uh, bought us. And I went I heard John Manassi play. You haven't heard John. He's a wonderful clarinet player. Fabulous. And he did the Weber was a Weber quintet. I think he did the Weber quintet, and he really played it magnificently. And I went back to see him after the concert, and I started reached out to shake his hand, and he turned away from me, and he opened the pouch of his clarinet case, and he had the the, the reed finishing system in there, and he looked back at me, and he said, "This saved my life in Japan." Wow. And. Which was was real nice. Uh, I've always really liked John a lot. But so the the reed system got into a lot of professional players, but I didn't develop it for them, you know. Because I, I, my heart has always been caring about starting off kids properly, and and having the kids have good equipment. That's why I developed the clarinets that I did. Though a lot of professionals that are playing them, um, is so that. The clarinet, they can play it successfully, they can make real progress, and they can have just a heck of a lot of fun doing it, and so they'll keep playing the rest of their lives, and when they do that, everybody's a winner. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I know I've taught uh, beginning band forever, and you know it's so frustrating for a young student, especially nowadays, because the generations are different, but if yep. they don't get that immediate success, then yep. a lot of them tend to quit. You know, it's not the same as when I was growing up, when you were growing up, where you, you sit there and you keep trying and trying and trying, you know, yeah. and uh, you put the effort in. It's, it's just a lot different today. But, you know, nowadays with kids, if they don't have that immediate success, they, they think there's something wrong with them first. They would not they would not blame the instrument, which is interesting. I find that interesting. And they certainly yep. wouldn't think about blaming the reed. Um, and then they, they just think that they were terrible and they would quit. Whereas if you if like you said, if the equipment is good, um, you know, especially uh, if the equipment is good, then you have a better chance of, of a better start. And it just reminds me, too, when I was first teaching in public schools in New York, we our school system was using a company that uh, they would give these kids the most awful instruments. They didn't work. They were it doesn't matter that they were old. That doesn't matter. But they just they didn't yeah. work. Leaks all over the place. Craziness. And, if they, you know, people would be wondering why their kids would be quitting all the time. You know, and then finally, uh, a new person came into town, uh, had the kids renting better instruments. They were newer. Um, music and arts actually came into town where they rent brand new instruments, and it's a rent-to-own system. And, boy, the landscape changed. It's the same thing. You know, I always have that argument, you know, when you're renting or when you're building uh, beginner instruments for students, they shouldn't be made – they should be made very well. Because right. those are the kids that need it. Yes, professionals need it, but the kids need it too. Beginners need it too because they don't know enough to know whether it's the instrument or them. Exactly. It's exactly. And I, I found that, you know, like, uh, I think I've got a, I've actually have a lecture. I have a, over 100 YouTube uh, videos. Um, and, and they're all on, you know, on, they're free educational videos. I mean, some of them promote our products, but usually at the end of a, a video or something, but mostly they're just pure educational products, teaching clarinet players how to, uh, 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 educational movies, teaching people how to do everything, how to play and, and how to analyze things and, and, uh, you know, how, how to solve problems. And, 
So I- anyway, uh, they're they're all there online. I'm sort of going to start to lose uh, track uh, of my thinking. Uh, but um, uh, so what, what were you you were saying about? Um, um, yeah, the beginner instruments and stuff, and I'm just remembering too. I'm going to include a link to your uh, to your YouTube channel, and yeah. at the end, I'm also going to ask you for your website as well, and I'll include a link in the uh, show notes for for people so that they can find out more about you, get access to that educational information, but also especially um, to buy the ATG Read Finishing System as well as your books for uh, you know on clarinet. Um, but yeah, you were we were talking about like beginner instruments with better quality. Yeah, I mean the. One of the um, frustrating things is that is that parents with the attitude that oh uh, we'll just get the kid to play this piece of junk and the clarinet's very very criti- very critically needs to be at least in good condition okay and we'll get him to play this piece of junk and, and if he or she continues then we'll think about getting something better right so that's that's just a self fulfilling uh, you know formula for disaster. Right, because the kids are going to struggle, and they're going to think I'm really no good, I'm really terrible. I mean, I, there was a professional line of clarinets. I, I, I did a lot of analysis on on other brands of clarinets and stuff. And at one point, I was analyzing these clarinets that were considered the best, right? And uh, the clarinets, the upper clarion, was flat on the instrument, and especially the high C, which is normally sharp on that particular instrument was 10 cents flat, right? And I was thinking, here's the, and I, w- I would do the work to correct the acoustical problems, right? Uh, but I would think, well, here's an instrument that everybody says is the best, this is the thing that you get, right? So the kid gets it, the high C plays 10 cents flat, the, a kid won't be able to get up to pitch, and the band director will be ragging him, so the student will be saying, gee, I, I got the best horn, so it must I mean I just really stink, right? Yeah. And they, discouraged and quit right it's so it's so important the the to have the knowledge and to have the understanding because it can uh, it, it can be the difference between a kid quitting and the kid continuing to play happily and to have some sense of self-esteem and believe me it makes a big difference Bob Mincer is a jazz player and from New York and I went to school with Bob Mincer and we got to be very good friends. used to play duets uh, he's a sax player, but he played clarinet. He's really gifted. And anyway, uh, he told me, he said, you know, so many of the my friends in New York, uh, he said, they're dead. They they didn't make it. Because, wow. you know, I guess he was brought up not what you call the best section of the, you know. And, and he said, he said, music saved me. It, it saved me, right? And he's he's become a tremendous recording artist and a tremendously talented. But but there's a case, you know, where he had that one thing that kept him off the streets, that kept him out of trouble, kept him from the, the gangs and the drugs and all that stuff. And uh, I never forget him telling me that because I grew up in the mountains of Kentucky in a coal mining area, you know. And believe me, when somebody said, "Would you like some drugs?" Up there, the only thing that would come to anybody's mind, and I'm talking about you being in high school, right? The only thing that ever crossed your mind would be, I don't have a headache, you know, because you'd be thinking about aspirin. Yeah, wow. Honest to God. And that's my my daughter. One of my daughters have three daughters. And uh, one of my daughters was looking through my yearbook in high school, and she said, Dad, you all look so innocent. And I said, well, honey, we were. We were, we were very innocent, because um, we never we, you know we we didn't um, we didn't know marijuana from uh, from uh, marinara sauce, you know. So it was. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. definitely a totally different world than New York City and the New York City metro area, and even the. Uh, even the L.A., uh, that's not really a downtown per se over here, but, you know, some of the inner parts of, of L.A. where, yeah, it's a totally different situation. And that's why, you know, music absolutely saves not only kids, but everybody. I have so many uh, people subscribe to my newsletter that are over the age of 50 wanting to take up instruments because it's on their bucket list or it's something yep. that they've always wanted to do. And they want that, that enjoyment 
you know, of playing and playing their favorite songs. And, and they get so frustrated, and I can totally understand. They get so frustrated with their reads, their mouthpiece setup. Um, you know, they're thinking about, you know, I've got, to, uh, I've got to have the best equipment available. Absolutely, you do. My thing also is that you've got to have the best foundation available too. Yep. But you, yep. you have to have the reads working without a doubt. And uh, I'm so grateful for the newsletter subscribers of mine that told me about you. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to reach out to you and I want to tell people about this. So the cool thing, um, first of all, how can we reach you? What's your website? Oh, uh, uh, let me, I'll tell you this, but I wanted to tell you this before. I, with, as far as the read system goes, uh, you know, there are a lot of people, for foolishly, they throw their reads away, but a lot of people, they play reads that are unplayable, and, and then they put them away in a, in a desk drawer or something. They have boxes full of reads, right? So many, I can't tell you how many letters and how many notes I've gotten from people about the read system saying, you know, I got your read finishing system. And I've got a backlog, five-year backlog of reads, and I'm making every one of them work that didn't work before. I may not buy reads for five years. Oh, don't tell Van Doren. <laughs> Sorry. And I know. Well, I know. I was, I was, I, after I got so many of those letters, I thought, maybe Van Doren's going to put a hit on it, hit out on me. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, Tom Pulwalski played principal for 20-some years in the U.S. Army Band. I got a note from him one time, and he said, my name's Tom Pulwalski. I was principal clarinet. I'm retired now from the U.S. Army field band. It's in Washington. And he said, uh, in my playing career, I've used every machine and everything possible to work on reads to make them play better. And he said, I got your system a month ago, and I've been using it. And he said, all the machines I have are now on, up on eBay for sale. <laughs> so, That's um, awesome. That's, that's, that's gratifying to hear, but you know, the thing, the read system has disappointed me in the fact that it hasn't caught on with the educators. They're skeptical about it. They, many of them have no idea that reads can actually be worked on, yeah. or they think the idea that if reads play badly, it's because that, that uh, it's bad cane. And I learned early on that there are many, many more reads because of bad cut, bad structural, uh, uh, you know, results from the from the machining, than than bad cane. What what bad cane will do is it generally it affects the durability of a read, but but as far as so it doesn't last long. It's a you know it's what you call a fifteen minute wonder. You know you play it for fifteen minutes and then you wonder why you bought it, but uh, <laughs> but. Uh, it's it's bad, it, but it's not bad cane. It's bad structure in, in the read that caused so many reads to play and respond and sound badly with all the kinds of concomitant problems that you run in with, you know, like breathiness and whistling and, and uh, uh, sluggishness in response, of lack of clarity, uh, you know, just all, all the, the whole the whole uh, sus you know list of suspects uh, when it comes to reads, but if you balance them well, you'll play a lot better. But the band directors they seem to be they seem to be very skeptical about this. And the only way I I've, see I really wanted this system to go to the kids, and the system's inexpensive, it's easy to use, it's easy to carry around, and uh, and I think one kids once kids learn how to balance the re how to test the reads correctly and balance the reads correctly, they're going to significantly saxophone and clarinet any single read. They're going to significantly improve uh, their sound and their joy in playing and their ease because everybody knows how much better you play when you've got a really great read, right? Oh my God, you don't want to give up that read for anything for anything. Exactly. And so I, you know, I tell players this. I said, think about the best read you've got. I said, now think about that best read you've got becoming just another practice read because you will have much better reads than that all the time. You will have an embarrassment of riches. You will give away reads to people, and you'll never have to worry about reads again. And I'll tell them that. I said, if that's not true, send your system back. I'll give your money back. I've never refunded a dime. Yeah, because it, it definitely works. And you know what I think it is, too, with educators? We're not, 
uh, when teachers are teaching in college the instrumental methods class, yep. it depends on what their their uh, what they grew up playing. Okay, what their you know what their main instrument is. So if you have a brass person teaching, and I grew up playing brass, we're not going to know about reed fish, finishing, and we're going to be like, oh no, that deals with reed knives. I don't want to go anywhere near that. Um, so it's not. It, I don't think it's taught to uh, music educators in training, music educators that are in go, you know, taking courses in college, where I think it absolutely should be. You know, it absolutely should be. And especially for people that are percussionists or brass players or string players, because a lot of string players also have to teach band as well. I think it's right. super important um, because, you know, you're going to come across kids that are struggling and you're trying to figure out, you're trying to help them problem solve. And chances are, it may just be that the reed's not balanced. That's the right. problem. Right. Well, inspecting a reed visually is very hard to, to, to tell. Uh, but it's right. I mean, it, look, uh, we're not just talking about band directors. No, we're not. No, no need to tear down on band directors. Um, we're talking about supposedly professional clarinet players that are teaching in universities that are completely lost with that. You know, I knew guys with big reputations in New York City and people went to study with them and they were completely incompetent to do any of this stuff. You know, they 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 were too lazy to t teach the fundamentals and they just wanted to do the fun of working on on, on playing pieces and interpreting pieces. Well, gosh, you can learn that from a cellist. Right. When you go to study clarinet, you go to study the clarinet. Right. I, I took uh, the best clarinet lessons I ever got were like from oboists and cellists and people that played other instruments as far as the musical stuff went. Oh, I right. See, I see. And my biggest influences as a clarinet player were Dietrich Fischer Dieskau and Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. They were singers. So I didn't even listen to clarinet playing except for Harold Wright. And um, so uh, but if you go to a clarinet teacher, He's there to fix your clarinet problems. He's there to analyze your clarinet problems, to to tame the beast because it's very, very equipment sensitive. It can, it can. You can play a poorly balanced reed, unbalanced reed, and your chops can be like all messed up within 15 minutes. And if you play a really comfortable setup that's well balanced, you can play low, high, loud, and soft, you know, very easily, and everything responds. You sit there and play three hours. It's it's a it's it destroys your the integrity of what I, I say goes on behind your nose right uh, the, this the instrument it, it has, it's got to work efficiently and it's got to work efficiently from the tip of the mouthpiece right down to the bell of the horn and when you in an educator's guide I actually talk about that and and I use the term acoustical efficiency which basically means uh, it sounds like some kind of jargonese phrase but I define it. I, I hate jargon. I define it. So, you know, to the degree that you can play low, high, and loud and soft with a minimum of embouchure air pressure exchange, to that degree, the instrument and the equipment is acoustically efficient. Makes total sense. Right. right? And and you can even draw down the bromide or the. Uh, you can draw it down even more concisely. You can say. To the degree uh, you can play the full pitch and dynamic range of your horn with a minimum of embouchure air pressure exchange, to that degree, you really have an efficient, it's acoustically efficient equipment, right? And that's like sitting down at a grand piano that has this beautiful matched drop for every key, right? right. So then you play with great artistry and great control because you can depend that everything's going to be there uh, consistently from bottom to top. So that's always been the design of clarinets when I was at LeBlanc. And uh, with the design of the clarinets that, that my company sells now, that I, I do the acoustical design, but also finish them. And the mouthpieces and reeds and all this always been that to make the clarinet less of a struggle and more of a joy to play. So the, the music can come out instead of, just feeling like you you've just got through with technical ad, uh, accuracy, uh, adequacy, so to speak, what, or what um, Madame Levine used to call a primitive information. You know, that the primitive information is sort of out of the way, right? And you're ready to go and to do something really musical. 
Uh, but getting back to the young kids, the young kids are so important because you're right. You're so right, and probably more so than ever because the kids have so many distractions. Uh, if, if they find they're struggling and it's really difficult for them, uh, then – you know, they, they, they quit because it's easier to play a video game than it is, you know, you know, to, to work out a beautiful, even scale and, and a beautiful legato and, and beautiful intervals and, uh, and all that. And then master all the things. I mean, it's very complicated playing an instrument. It's very complicated because you're doing a lot behind your nose and a lot of stuff is coming out of the horn and you're looking at the music and, it's it's very complicated, and the 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 simpler you can make this interface of the of the equipment, then uh, the more the player can concentrate on what's on the page and lifting it off the page, and having a really beautiful musical experience. So Absolutely. that's always been my goal. That's always been what I thought. Um, yeah, you know, so, I mean, some people have pay, played my equipment, professionals. So this is a shocker, but. I had people play like some of the clarinets I designed at LeBlanc, and it easily did things that they had to work hard with their with their own instruments. And I saw them get angry. And one guy said, "This is like cheating." Like, I thought, really? Uh, it's so your your goal is just to it's like going in going into the cage with the lion when you play the clarinet right it, you know i'd rather have the clarinet be going going in and meeting a friend i'm having a good time with right so yeah, that's awesome. and, that, that's i just I always think it's crazy that it should be hard to play it should be difficult a challenge to play it's the music should be hard to play Right. And that's you know. what and that's what um, and we're going to have to uh, close this up in a second. But that's yeah. what your reed finishing system does. It, it definitely makes it so much more pleasant and easier to play. So, Tom, what is the uh, what is your website where people can reach you at? Uh, it's uh, ridden our clarinet products dot com. And folks, I'm going to put that in the show notes so that you can definitely click on that link, check that out. And right. um, for a very limited time, folks, very limited time, uh, you're going to get a special discount. Tom is really kind enough to do this. You're going to get a special discount. You want to talk to us just a pinch about that, that discount that people are going to get. Uh, well, uh, you know, I wrote you about the discount, and I, I'm not a numbers guy, so I, I don't remember. I think it was... Uh, like a 15 or 20 percent discount on, on the read system I, I can't exactly remember but the discount's going to go through january 15th and uh really this is you know you get this read finishing system and and basically you spend a, a very short amount of time learning to test and using the basic finishing tools and you know, you've got you've got good reads the rest of your life i mean i mean a person would sell his family down the road in the past for that, right? Like, yeah. And, sorry, mom, but I've got to have these reads. But, uh, but, but really, but you know, for a very small amount of money and, and a minimal amount of effort, you have the best reads. To, uh, as long as you play the clarinet, or as long as you play the saxophone, you'll have excellent reads to play. Never be worried about, oh, I've got to have a good read. I'm going to hold this read back for this concert. Uh, this is the only one I've got. No, no, you'll have six or seven or eight to, to, to choose from. So uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful system because it frees, frees you up, frees your worries up. Uh, and I would say my YouTube, I, I've always gone by Tom because uh, Tom's my middle name. It's, it's kind of a Southern thing, you know. Uh, but my first name is William, so on my on my website, the clarinet site, if someone just goes into YouTube and 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 uh, in the search, just puts uh, William Ridenour clarinet, my all those videos that I have that are educational videos will pop up, and there's actually even one video uh, that talks about the distinction between clarinet playing and saxophone playing and what goes on behind the nose, so that saxophone players or multi-read players can get a better idea of how to produce a real characteristic sound on both instruments you know oh, that's awesome it's, it's quite different tongue position and voicing and everything's quite different um for a characteristic you know uh, to get a characteristic sound uh, i just i mean 
this is kind of in a way off the subject, but I was at a convention one time and a, a, a young player came over, a very gifted guy, and I found he was teaching, he was uh, getting his doctorate in multiple woodwinds uh, um, at a university, and, and he's playing through the, the clarinets the I designed, and and uh, he picked up one clarinet and began to play it, and I turned around and I said, I really like the way you sound on that one. That one sounds best. And he said, yeah, why? I said, well, because that, that clarinet compensates so that it, it gives you more focus and more center in the sound uh, and makes you sound more like a clarinet player because it, it, that's, the clarinet's not your instrument, right? And and I could see his face fall. He's like, how could you tell? And I sat for five minutes and I talked to him about the different tongue position and the voicing and what that dude did to shape and color uh, and how a characteristic clarinet tone required the tongue position to be here and this is what you should listen for and in five minutes he was playing a beaut- I said now that's really a nice characteristic clarinet sound and he said what why haven't my teachers told me that and I said I don't know I, you have to ask them that all I know is this is what works so that's, that's awesome you know. and I'm gonna definitely recommend your um, I'll definitely put that link for uh, yep. your website but also you know the information to do the search for your YouTube channel thank you for the clarification uh, we've been emailing back and forth I'm thinking why yeah. is it William I keep calling him Tom <laughs> thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> well like, you know you go by your middle name and and if somebody calls you William back home you're in trouble oh yeah. <laughs> well, you're not in trouble here, and I wanted to thank you so much. This was this was really a lot of fun and and very informative, and um, I I know that the listeners are going to get so much out of this, especially you know if if they've always often wondered how do you you know adjust your reads and stuff like that. Now you know, and you've got to get your hands on this ATG read finishing system. The discount will go through January fifteenth, two thousand seventeen. So right. get your hands on one right away, and I'm telling you, you're gonna get. You're going to get more than your money's worth. You're going to be saving so much money on reads, and you, every read's just going to work out of the box. It's going to be awesome. Well, so, listen, uh, thank, thanks so much for, for doing this. very kind of you to do this because, you know, it's very hard to get your message out to, to people. Uh, we don't have an advertising budget. Everything we do with clarinets and mouthpieces and everything, it's all done just through word of mouth, and, and we don't even have any. I mean, a lot of really fine players play our stuff, but we don't pay for endorsement. We don't have endorsers. We, we refuse to do that uh, because it's such a corrupted thing uh, anyway. And besides, we're kind of cheap. But anyway, uh, but uh, no, really, we don't have endorsers. And it, no one hears about us unless they hear about it from someone else. You know, that's true. So it's very kind of we appreciate it. Absolutely. And they're going to hear about it from me. So thanks so much, <laughs> William. No, Tom. <laughs> uh, yeah. Take care. Have a great All right. day. All right, you too. <laughs>